It's day 42 of being snowbound. If things don't improve soon, I may have to resort to eating pages from my operating systems book. Alright, so here we are in process synchronization. We're going to discuss these three topics. Uh, I'll note that uh, Peterson's solution, um, pay close attention to it, will help you with the uh, Decker's solution uh, problem uh, in today's problem set. Here are the chapter objectives. So here's the background. We know that processes can execute concurrently. That means that their execution is interleaved. So we execute some number of instructions from one process, then perform a contact switch, per, uh, execute uh, some number of instructions from another process, etc., etc., etc. We don't know the rate at which those contact switches occur. Uh, it could be after thousands or millions of instructions or billions or in the worst case uh, it could be every other instruction um, that's highly unlikely but we don't know that right so we're not going to assume that that's the case right so um, so we have that we also know that processes can share data and here I'm thinking of shared memory rather than the message passing model. Uh, so with that data sharing, we have to be careful about how the data accesses are, are interleaved or the data could end up in an, an incorrect or inconsistent state. And we need to avoid that uh, at all costs. So uh, in the next slide or two, we'll look at an example of this problem. So here we're uh, looking at a solution, in quotes, uh, to the producer-consumer problem in which uh, we're using all the buffers. So here is the, uh, the logical code for the producer, where the producer can keep producing uh, so long as there is an empty buffer. And the way that uh, the producer checks to see if there's an empty buffer is uh, with that while condition there. So if um, counter, which is counting the number of full buffers, is equal to buffer size, which is the number of buffers, then the producer should spin. But otherwise, uh, the producer can fill a buffer, uh, increment its index to the uh, to the next buffer to be filled, uh, increment the counter, and then go back to the top. The code for the consumer is similar. Um, if counter is equal to zero, then there are no full buffers, so the consumer should spin. Otherwise, it can consume a buffer, increment its uh, index to the next available buffer, and then decrease uh, the number of filled buffers by decrementing uh, counter there. So here we see uh, the race condition. So uh, this implementation of counter plus plus, uh, think of it as at the assembly language level. So uh, we perform uh, a load operation to get the counter variable in from memory into a register, then perform the addition and then perform a store operation uh, to get the value of the variable back out in the memory. Similarly for, uh, for counter minus minus. Um, load it in a register, uh, decrement it by one, and then store it back out to memory. So here's the race condition. Suppose count is five and we're performing counter plus plus uh, in the producer and counter minus minus in the consumer uh, near simultaneously uh, and interleaving uh, every other instruction between each process. So at the end, count should still have the value 5, but in this particular interleaving, uh, count or counter will be 4, which is incorrect. This is the situation we want to avoid. So this leads to the, uh, the definition of the critical section problem. So uh, we have some number of processes um, trying to access and modify shared data. 
uh, the sections in each process's code in which the process is uh, accessing this shared data is referred to as a critical section. And the, the critical section problem is ensuring that no more than one process is executing in its critical section at one at any one point in time. So this shows the general structure of one of the processes. Uh, we're assuming that the process is in an infinite loop. Here's the critical section. Uh, the right remember the uh, the section of code uh, in which shared variables are being accessed. So we're simplifying. Uh, the problem uh, such that each process has a single critical section. This could easily be generalized to any number of critical sections. And then the remainder section uh, is code in which shared variables are not being accessed. So the entry section is where the process synchronizes the wait here until uh, they're permitted to enter their critical sections and the uh, exit section is where uh, in essence a process cleans up after itself after it leaves the critical section to uh, allow access, access for the next process uh, trying to get into its critical section. So let's go ahead and assume that we're trying to solve the critical section problem for two processes uh, PI and PJ. Here we see uh, the code for process PI. So um, they have a, a shared turn variable that they use to control entry into the critical section. So the code for uh, process PI, if it is J's turn, process PI uh, spins, then uh, Presumably, PJ is in its critical section. You can see that when, uh, well, you can imagine the code for PJ when when uh, when PJ exits its critical section, it sets the turn to I, at which point uh, process I uh, that th that condition there would go false for I, and I would begin uh, executing its critical section. The problem we have here is that we, this solution requires strict alternation of the processes. So if PI, for example, were making progress much more quickly than PJ, uh, it couldn't enter its critical section twice consecutively, even if PJ um, was not intending to enter its uh, its critical section at all, uh, and that's a that's a shortcoming here uh, that we'll address in the next slide. So we'll say that any solution of the critical section problem has to have these three properties: first and most importantly, mutual exclusion, which says that at most one process is in its critical section, and progress, which the previous quote solution unquote violated. If there are a, several processes waiting to enter their critical sections, one will within a finite amount of time. Um, in a sense, you can think of this one as saying that at least one process is in the critical section. Uh, but remember that mutual exclusion says that at most one is in uh, progress. Of course, uh, only hold, holds if if there are a process or is a process or are processes waiting to get in. So combined, uh, one and two say zero or one processes are in the critical sections. Bounded waiting uh, basically says that if you're waiting to get into your critical section, you won't have to wait an, an infinite number of times. And that's expressed as uh, there's a bounded number of times that the other processes will enter their critical sections before 
um, the given process finally enters its critical section. Uh, it could be a while, but it won't be uh, an, uh, an unbounded wait. So a a non-preemptive kernel here would treat the, uh, the entire kernel as one large critical section. Uh, a preemptive kernel um, will imply that there are bits and pieces of critical sections uh, within, the, within the kernel. We'll finish today with Peterson's solution to the critical section, uh, the critical section problem, uh, which is a, a two-process solution, as you can see here, uh, and it assumes that at the machine level, the load and store operations are atomic. We at the uh, entry and exit sections make uh, use of two shared variables. Turn indicates which process has priority and flag is, is used to indicate that a process is attempting to enter its critical section. So here's Peterson's algorithm. So as you can see, uh, process I, and again we have uh, process I and process J. Process I sets its flag to true, indicating that it is attempting to enter its critical section. Then, this is key, note that it gives priority to the other process by setting turn to J. And then so long as the other process is attempting to enter its critical section or in its critical section and it's the other process's turn, process I waits. Well, as you can see, uh, when a process leaves its critical section, it sets its uh, flag to false. Uh, let's review the, uh, the, the three properties of a solution to the critical section problem. So once again, we need to uh, ensure that the solution uh, has these three properties, mutual exclusion, progress, and banded weighting. If one process, let's say a process J is in its critical section and, and uh, process I starts to execute its, its entry code, uh, we said that I sets its flag true it sets turn to J, and well, J is in its critical section, so flag for it will be true, and turn will be J. Uh, I set turn to J, so I will wait here. Now, let's say that both processes were executing their entry sections in lockstep. And let's assume somehow that both processes uh, entered their critical sections simultaneously. Now, what does that imply? Well, the only way that both processes could enter their critical sections simultaneously was if turn here uh, simultaneously had two values, which it can't, which is a contradiction. Therefore, right by proof by contradiction, it can't be the case that both processes can enter their critical sections uh, simultaneously. So that proves mutual exclusion. Let's look at progress now. So suppose that uh, PI is in its entry section and uh, PJ is in its remainder section. So I sets its flag true, sets turn to J, but then uh, that doesn't matter because J's flag will be false. So uh, PI will enter its critical section immediately. Now let's move on to, to bounded weighting. Let's assume that PI is, is waiting uh, at the while loop there and that uh, process J is in its critical section. And uh, then let's assume that uh, process J exits its critical section, setting its flag to false, and then immediately tries to re-enter the critical section. Well, it'll set turn to I uh, and then 
PJ will block in the while and when uh, PI finally gains control of the CPU again after a contact switch, uh, it will be it will uh, be able to enter its critical section because now uh, turn is I rather than J. All right, so we've uh, now shown that Peterson's solution has all three requirements of a solution to the critical section problem. I just can't do it. Would someone email me a pizza, please? <laughs>